When he was seven, Charlie was obsessed with kingfishers. When he was 13, just looking at animals wasn't enough, and he was compelled to take pictures of them. So it's hardly surprising that Charlie became a wildlife photographer, and his job has taken him to the most remote corners of the planet. He often says that the world is easier to understand through the lens of a camera. But if you've been to the places Charlie's been, you can't escape one simple fact. Time is running out for our world. I didn't want to sit around and spend my life being depressed about the environment and not doing anything about it. So I thought, right, if I do my bit, then at least I know in my life I've done my bit, however small that is. Charlie wants to make a difference, so he did something that sounds crazy. He went to Peru to buy a rainforest. It makes you realise how important this place is. To know that there's still people in there that have got no contact with the outside world. loggers, ranchers, and gold miners from cutting it down. The more time he spent with local people, the deeper and deeper he got drawn into their lives. There are those that say it's already too late, that human beings have wrecked the planet. But if we're all going down, Charlie's going down fighting. It's estimated that the Amazon is home to a quarter of every land-based species on the planet. And yet, we've studied less than 1% of this ancient rainforest. It stood for more than 20 million years. But if we continue to destroy it at the current rate, it will all be gone in less than 200. But the most staggering fact about the Amazon is that we've been hearing for so long that it needs protection that we just don't care. Or at least we don't care enough to do anything about it. I got a phone call one day from my mate in Peru and he just said to me out of the blue, do you want to buy some rainforest? And really without even thinking about it, I just said, yeah. So I've gone and bought a hundred acres of forest. Yeah. Well, me and your mum have bought it. Why did you just buy it when you had never seen it? It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a perfect question. I didn't really tell Philippa immediately. I just went ahead and did it. And subsequently, she has gone to great lengths to point out all the gaping holes in my knowledge of the place and my trust for people. I knew what he was going to do. From the moment he started even mumbling about it, I knew where it was headed. <laughs> And I knew why he needed to do it. We all just need him to go there, see it, and then just come home.
Charlie has flown to Cusco, the last big city in Peru before the western Amazon basin. His land is still a day's drive away. But before he gets to see it, Charlie has to pay £6,000 for his 100 acres of rainforest. Es la primera vez que veo a un británico haber adquirido un terreno de este tipo. No sé qué va a hacer con el terreno, pero lo veo muy contento, Charles. Así que muy buena suerte, Charles. And we can stop going up now for about two hours. It's just on the other side of this hill. <laughs> the problem is this hill is the Andes and it seems to be going on forever. And the thing is, I'll get there. And it just looked like all the other forests. <laughs> It'd be my bit. <laughs> Of course, you have to be pretty well off to entertain the idea of trying to save a rainforest. Conservation is a luxury mainly enjoyed by the rich. And let's not forget that in Britain we've never been shy of using our resources. After all, we've cut down most of our trees, killed half of the wildlife and poisoned the sea. But sometimes we have to draw a line, and for Charlie, that line is Manu National Park. The thing about Manu is that of all the rainforests in the world, it is the best one. And it's the most biodiverse place on Earth. Some of the stats about it just mind blowing. To think that in one national park, it's about half the size of Switzerland, you can have 10% of all the bird species in the world. That, that's what we're dealing with here. Although it's a protected area, Manu is under attack from illegal loggers. But to get into the park, they have to go through Charlie's land, which is strategically placed at the end of the only road for miles around. And one of the reasons he bought it was to find a way to stop people smuggling valuable hardwoods out of the forest. Well, that's it. It's a shame it's pitch black, isn't it? <laughs> but before he gets to grips with the issues facing this corner of Manu, Charlie wants to see exactly what he's bought. Oh, this is beautiful. When you think of the Amazon, South America, all that, that's what I'm thinking of. Place right there. The camp is just there, and there's a little trail coming down. Need to get the machete on it. Walk down to here. Look at that, there's the bath. This is my bathroom then. It's gotta be. Beautiful. Someone's cut this trail within the last couple of months. This looks nice, but it's not. This is knackered forest. So this is all just crappy grass, bamboo. All these things that grow fast once the forest has been cut down. But the diversity here is unbelievable. And probably being stalked by about three or four different species of mosquito at the moment. And there's cracking bird life here. Insect life is unbelievable. It's still important stuff, secondary forest. It's still packed with life. And, um,. You know, now I'm here to protect it, it's only going to get better, isn't it? So, 
Who knows what we could end up with. At the end of the first day, Charlie's only explored a third of his land. But it's clear that the big trees were taken long ago, which is why the loggers have moved into Marnie. But the park authorities are so underfunded that there's little they can do about it. There are only 26 guards to patrol 17,000 square kilometers. So Charlie's taking matters into his own hands. I bought the land because I wanted to do some good. So the idea now is I'd stop illegal loggers getting into the national park and logging it. There has to be rules, there has to be regulation, there has to be decent protection for Marnie National Park. It is so important, not just in Peru, but to the world. I know it's only a sign with some words written on it. It kind of makes it official now. And it says, don't mess around with my bit of forest. Not on my watch. Charlie is going to stay in the Amazon for the next few months to explore all the threats facing the rainforest and to try and find ways to protect his land and the national park. I'm already covered in bites, probably because I've got a tent full of biting flies. Charlie's job often takes him to remote places, but he rarely contacts his family. If you get homesick in the middle of the rainforest, you'd soon go mad with the bugs and the heat. The experience of walking into a rainforest is bizarre. It's claustrophobic, it's hot, it's deeply uncomfortable. And you can't escape, there's no way of escaping the feeling you get from it. And then, you're basically a walking salt cellar. There's very little salt in the Amazon. So the moment you walk in and start sweating, everything wants a piece of the action. So you, you get covered with insects all trying to get salt off you. And then, also, adding to that, you've got all these other insects, the biting ones, that are trying to get blood out of you. So you very quickly become a valuable part of the, the ecosystem, part of the organism. The green hell, they call it. That's what it is. For anyone used to Western comforts, living in the rainforest is like living in a kettle. A kettle full of mosquitoes. But because it's so rammed with life, the Amazon is Charlie's favourite place on Earth. Where's he gone? Where's he gone? <laughs> you think, oh yeah, I'll just document all the insects I find. All that, there could be half a million. I'll be doing this for the next 500 years. I got you, I got you, I got you. Look. So far, Charlie's seen little more than grass and bamboo in his patch of forest. But over the border in Marnie, it's estimated that every acre contains nearly three times more native trees than the whole of Great Britain. So it's not just of interest to the people wanting to cut it down, it also attracts the occasional scientist. Thanks Rob, don't mind me. Rob Williams is a conservation biologist, and Charlie's nabbed him to explore the area of his land closest to the national park. And there's a hut there, look. Hola. Hola. Got some chainsaw blades. It's 
points row. That's coca. What cocaine? This is the coca leaf that they yeah that cocaine's made from. Finally, someone's got to have it, haven't they? Go in. Yeah. Mm, that's not good. It's really weird. That's spooky. Wandering around someone's house. Some forest has been cut down. I think this explains the coca leaves in the house. Why? It looks like coca plants to me. Should we go and have a look? If that's coca plants, do we really want to be walking up here? Shouldn't we be a bit scared? You've got quite a production here, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, look at it. Someone's been here recently uh, pruning and harvesting. What how recently? I mean, within days. Yeah, I mean, he's eating his pineapple and laying down on a sheet of plastic and a nice soft cut vegetation. Um, so, well, that's just, uh, that's just blown a massive hole in the rainforest bottle. Coca leaves have been a sacred part of South American culture for thousands of years. But Peru is now the largest exporter of cocaine in the world. And Charlie's ragged patch of land is the reality of what's happening to the rainforest. According to the park guards, Charlie doesn't just have a field of coca to worry about. Somebody has written a reply to his sign on the border of his land. Do you think it's a genuine threat? What a massive cock up. It looks like Charlie has been terribly naive. It's rumored that the guy who owned the land before him is a local crook called Tito, who did time for processing cocaine. The guards suspect that Tito and his son Ilias are one of the families logging the national park, and that they are still using the hut on Charlie's land as a base. It's not somewhere that I feel particularly safe anymore. 
it worries me that at any moment, you know, a load of guys on motorbikes could turn up with guns and do me over and rob me. And that's not really what I had in mind when I bought it. But Jesus, probably the best purchase I've ever made. I don't know what to do with it. I'm a bit down on it, but yeah. Spurting a whole load of crap sitting around my house doing nothing. Oh, I've bitten off way more than I can chew. I'm useless at doing anything but take photos. After two weeks, Charlie has had enough and decides he needs to get away from the problems on his land. He's not the first Westerner with deep pockets to try and save a rainforest. But fortunately for Charlie, not all of them have been scared off by the local people. A day's boat journey east is the Crease Foundation, a research centre that specialises in trying to understand how to restore damaged rainforest just like Charlie's. He couldn't have come to a better place for advice. But Charlie's more interested in photographing the animals being studied by head biologist Andy Whitworth. Look at his little face. Have you got the answer on him? I'd rather have it quickly. A poisonous one, Andy. <laughs> An arboreal pit viper. Um, one of the most dangerous ones out here. This is enough, maybe, for the first couple of hours until you would get somebody to a hospital. When you say it's a couple of hours until you get someone to a hospital, do you mean the hospital is 12 hours away in Cusco? Yeah, but we can stop at a small medical facility on the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay. Do you get nervous when you're doing this? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, that's fine. I never get complacent every time I handle a snake switched on. Can oh, it's beautiful. He's just... He's quite a mean little guy. He's going to be angry. He's going to want to strike. Okay. So, you see how he's essing now? He's ready like a spring. Ready to strike. He wants Can to you be. reach me from here? He's full body length. So, 70 centimetres, 80 centimetres. This guy's heavily hemotoxic, so if you take a bite from him, you're going to bleed, like, from your gums, from your nose, from your eyes. Cytotoxic as well, so it'll start to eat away the flesh. So if your skin falls off? Yeah, pretty much. You wouldn't think something so small would be so deadly. Oh, come on, little fella. Back on the hook. See, he's rattling his tail. He's getting really angry now. This is a tricky bit. You just gotta watch your fingers. Oh, that's not good. Don't come up there. Hey. Ah, uh, okay. Well done, sir. Cheers. Oh, it was lovely. What a beautiful animal. I'm a bit disappointed I didn't get to use my antivenom for the first time. <laughs> The foundation owned an area 20 times larger than Charlie's. There was once little more than a wasteland. But now it's grown back to create a healthy secondary rainforest. He's trying to jump on first, yeah. This would have all been logged, there would have been agriculture here, coffee, so you can see it can regenerate given time. So there is hope. To see what wildlife might return to his land if given the chance, Charlie has asked Andy to take him to an animal hotspot. <laughs> Andy, how far to go? An hour? No, only another hour. We've yeah. only been going, what, 25 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. We'll start getting to the hill soon. Oh good, we're a hill. Fantastic. 
There's very little salt in the Amazon, so mineral-rich areas are the forest equivalent of an oasis and attract animals from miles around. You know we're getting close now, you can start seeing trails all over the place. So this is where the salts must be coming from out of these rocks. And as the water's running off, it's gathering here in this pool. So you see the animals, they come in from all different directions. And you see them shoving their head right in here. They're eating this? Yeah. I think they're one of the most important things in the Western Amazon Basin. Without them, the animals just wouldn't exist. They need the salt so badly. And without these clay licks, they just wouldn't have it in their diet at all. The plants pretty much take everything up, so all the nutrients, everything in the forest is stored in the canopy. So the soils and everything down here is really poor. And then you suddenly get these little pockets of salt, and it's like gold to the animals. That's what they need. Camera traps automatically take photos of anything that passes in front of the lens. But it's often more luck than judgment, guessing where the animals are going to be. You turn your uh, tape here. Lovely. You do a good tape here. Many large mammals also use human trails, as they are the easiest way through the tangled undergrowth. Yeah, beautiful. There, there, I reckon. I think there are eight species of wild cats in Marnie, so it could be any of them, but they're really hard to see and to get shots of. I've done this for months in the past, so I only ever got one shot on it. Okay, cat man. He even snarled. And he's great. He's just a young, very enthusiastic, incredibly knowledgeable bloke who's just deeply in love with the forest. Wandering around it with him is an education. They call this Boca de Puta. <laughs> right, they're at the lips of a whore. <laughs> well, I thought you were just going to give me some amazing jungle fact. Boca de Puta! Nice tree there. Yeah. This is uh, this said Rolinga, Charlie. So if you planted a few of these on your land at the moment, these cedars, this forest here is pretty much what your your area should look like in sort of 30 years' time. Really? Yeah. Oh, this is beautiful. The real problem you're going to have, Charlie, is like when you start getting the trees like this and they get to a decent size, you're going to get people coming in. They're going to want these trees then. So it's a sort of vicious circle, isn't it? You make it better. Create a nice forest if I'm going to go and want to kill it and chop it down again. Well, you, you've got to be nuts to do something like that. But uh, I think I'm stupid. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. I'm still reading about the fact that I bought the worst bit in the most dangerous place in the area. And everyone's laughing at me. And I don't really want people knowing I'm there and knowing what I'm doing because I don't want to get shot or robbed or any of that stuff. And I'm vulnerable out there. I'm vulnerable camping in that place. It'll be a tough job. Charlie's not going to enjoy everything that he's got ahead of him because he's going to have to change. It's the local people that are going to protect it, not Charlie in 30 years' time. He's not still want to stand on that land and live in a tent and look after things. So the imperialistic idea of buying up rainforest in a developing country from the West isn't the solution. Charlie can't serve that land until he convinces local people why it's important to do it. And that's the challenge. Oh yeah, that's Jack. 
That's fresh. Yeah, you can see how wide that is. Got a camera trap up here? Yeah, we've got a camera trap. Not very far, but it's definitely a Jaguar pod. Could be watching us now, couldn't it? And if it is watching us now, what's the chance of us seeing it? So do you expect to see snakes in the park? One of the biggest ones I've ever found was just down this trail here, about another 300 metres on. Right. There's a big female Bushmaster, stretched right across the trail at two and a half metres. And the Bushmaster would kill you, would it? Oh, God, yeah. I will swap round and you can go at the front in a bit. Yeah, right. Oh, there's my camera trap. Look at how wide that is. How nervous am I? I get shot really wide. Nothing. Nothing. <gasps> it's a tuna! Oh, it's a tuna! <laughs> you got it. Big male. Let me see, let me see. Take him out. Oh. Okay. The camera traps reveal far more wildlife than Charlie expected to see in just a few days. But only ten years ago, this area was hunted out and there were practically no animals at all. The thing that's hit me more than anything else is the speed at which this forest has recovered. Oh, yeah. Whoa! <laughs> he's staring at <laughs> And that made me realise, actually, that, that really, in a fairly short period of time, I could get my bit of forest back up to being... Yeah, decent, good land, full of wildlife, full of diversity. So it's that's the main, I think, chunk of inspiration I've taken out of this place. Charlie's like a, a child in a way. Like uh, he has this inner passion for nature. Yeah, he wants to photograph it. That's his way of telling the world about why something's so special. But for him to buy a rainforest is completely off the cuff. Who knows what he was thinking when he did it, but... Um, yeah, he's going to learn a few things. The idea that we should create buffer zones around national parks to protect the most precious forests in the Amazon was first suggested in the 1970s. But conservationists now agree that it can't work unless the local communities are in charge. Unfortunately, Charlie's too scared to go back to his land and face the people he thinks are logging Marnum. And yet, wherever he goes, he sees more reasons to protect the park. This is unbelievable. Just there, this poor uncontacted Indian women. My heart is going completely crazy. Everyone keeps dead to the tail. They're shouting at us, I've got no idea what they're saying, obviously. never expected to to see them. You hear about them, but you just never expect to see them. As far as anyone knows, there are seven indigenous tribes living in voluntary isolation throughout Manu, but combined, they would number less than a few thousand individuals. Though they are rarely seen, and often aggressively defend their decision to be left alone, our world is not totally alien to the tribes. 
Missionaries and illegal loggers have been known to lure them from the forest with gifts of cooking pots and machetes. But any contact risks spreading disease and could wipe them out forever. Absolutely unbelievable. Oh, oh, what I just said. You know what? We are 30 miles from my land and there's some contact with women on the beach. That's incredible, isn't it? The uncontacted tribes have good reason to stay hidden. Between 1850 and 1930, entire populations were enslaved by American and European rubber barons. A quarter of a million indigenous people died throughout the Amazon so that we could have tires and condoms. But many of the tribes did not return to the forest, and two days from Charlie's land is the indigenous community of Belgica. Over the past hundred years, the Yini have embraced many aspects of the industrialized world, but they still see the rainforest as their home. <laughs> Para nosotros es un, una cosa importante en nuestro territorio, ¿no? Da, da un valor a nuestro territorio, a nuestro bosque, ¿no? Nosotros no queremos siempre vivir acá, ¿no? Y, y tranquilo, ¿no? Acá para nosotros es eh, una cosa que acá no tenemos, no hay amenazo, digamos, como en la ciudad, ¿no? To support the community, the Yini have a license to harvest a limited number of trees from their tribal homeland, a 500 square kilometre primary rainforest. The Yini manage their forest sustainably and allow each logged area to recover. But controversially, their quota permits them to cut down 90% of their big leaf mahogany, a threatened species that is protected in some South American countries. The mahogany is a rare beast now, and I've never seen one before. The sad and depressing thing is, is that that particular mahogany tree is is marked, and it's getting cut down in 24 hours' time. Last year, the Yinni cut down nine of the 150 mahogany trees on their land. But this forest is their only resource, and big leaf mahogany their most valuable asset. Each tree is worth three and a half thousand pounds to the Yinni, and by the time it's sold as luxury furniture in Britain and America, it could be worth 20 times as much. But Charlie wants to know, what the environmental cost is of cutting down one of these giants. And he's asked Andy to gather a group of biologists to catalogue every species that depend on this single tree for their survival. A bioblast is a bit of a sort of funky name for <laughs> some scientists looking at stuff. You take something like the mahogany tree and you very quickly assess how many different species there are so they can then have a picture of how much life this thing's sustaining. 
I'm going to photograph everything we can get so that we've got a picture record of it, not just a written record of a lesson. The thing about the rainforest is it's very rare to actually see anything in it. You get buzzed around by a load of insects, but to take insects from it and stick them on white, you get a really good chance to really have a look at them, completely removed from the massive tangle of confusing greenery. And it's then that you start to see the incredible complexity of all the life here. There are actual little characters in this, little, uh, little lives, and the place is just buzzing. You know, there's probably three or four species of bee just flying around me now. But until you actually get one of those, stick it on white, and have a decent look at it, you can't really relate to it. So you can see these birds almost all look the same, but they'll all have a slightly different niche, different things that they feed on. And a tree like the mahogany that we've got here provides all these different levels, these different homes, all the different food. And when you remove those trees, you can remove the complexity of the forest, it completely disappears. And so you end up with only the very common species, the generalists, and you lose the guys like this one that's more uncommon and probably a real specialist that probably relies on, on the tree that we're working on. There's an absolutely stunning butterfly that I've never seen before. Don't you move. Yes, I've got it. You got it. I've got it. Now what are you going to do? No! You lost it. No. The dirt and bees is just so painful. Time passes slowly for the big trees, and this mahogany could be anywhere between 100 and 400 years old. When it's cut down, fast-growing plants will rush in and scramble toward the light. And as the forest loses some of its oldest inhabitants, it's inevitable that it also loses the specialist plants and animals that rely on the extra sunlight that the upper branches provide. I can use top branches in the far back, there's some beautiful pink flowers. Oh, I see them. You see them? Yeah, I can see them, aren't they? Yeah, they are cool. Yeah, every time I write my arms, I get a bit of easier in there. Yeah, God! <laughs> it's just crazy! It's crazy! Oh my god! Nice. How can something so incredible just be so awful at the same time? We get the feeling the tree is trying to say something. Yeah, piss off and leave me alone. Yeah. not just because of things coming down but all these little lives that I looked at today everything's changing for them as well 
saying not just cutting down a tree or destroying a whole ecosystem and a whole world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's totally bizarre to me. There should be a demand for, for this. Because people think it looks nice. There's no reason on earth anyone in Britain needs anything made from a hole. Yet, we're still importing more mahogany than most other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm safe from that. Mm -hmm. Crap in. Yeah. Yeah. In the whole of Britain, there are seven native species of amphibian. Around one tree in the Amazon, the team found 21. In total, they found 204 different species in just 24 hours. Some are potentially new to science and may not exist anywhere else on Earth. But there's one species that depends on this tree that Charlie didn't think to photograph. I suppose the thing that gets me is I've watched since I was a kid and being taught at school all about the Amazon and rainforest destruction and logging and all these environmental problems. You know, I'm 40 now and those problems haven't gone away. It's all still happening. We had awareness in the 70s of what was happening to the Amazon. Bugger all's change, is it?
I know what. Over all the years, I uh, saw so a few things. Tables, coffins, get down there. Nothing at all says to me this is the fault of the community. It's not their fault, they could have survived. It was their land. I can't, I cannot understand why people, why people need to buy a new home in the first place. It's not. That blames it, but they're trying to sort it out so it doesn't have to happen. But they've got to survive. But I don't believe this is the way. embarked on this project I thought it would be much more simple. I thought I knew the problem and I knew the answers and actually the more I understand it the less I understand it. Because it's a very complex situation but I feel like at least I'm doing something. Three square kilometers of rainforest are destroyed every day in Peru, and up to 80% of the trees felled are cut down illegally. The system is so corrupt that by the time timber leaves the sawmills, it's almost impossible to know where it came from. But Charlie didn't come to Peru to solve all of the problems facing the Amazon. He wants to protect one corner of Marnie National Park. For the last three weeks, he's avoided returning to his land. But if he doesn't face up to the illegal loggers now, he may as well go home. Yeah, they must have been... What they do is they bring it all out and they pile it up and load it onto a truck. It's almost certain that the previous landowner Tito and his son Ilias have been moving wood through Charlie's land and the tire tracks lead to a field that he hasn't been to before. This massive area was burnt to the ground years ago and now it's being used to grow crops. Look, and there, just there, that room of trees, this national park. That's been logged. That should be primary forest there. If Tito and Ilias have been here recently, then it's possible they're still in the area. It's actually the worst situation we could be in. Ilias is illegally logging the park. And the whole reason I bought that land was to stop the National Park getting logged. Um, so I'm a bit, I suppose I'm a bit annoyed. I said, I think things to do is go and meet him. Fresh 
footprints. Yeah, that's that can't be more than half an hour old. This heat really dried out by now. It's weird, not tracking a human. I'm going to measure this one up. I don't really want to bust Elias illegally logging in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it could actually be quite dangerous. A chainsaw? Yeah. A chainsaw. And we're in the middle of nowhere. We just walked half an hour up a small forest creek. Elias! Elias! Hola! 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 Oh. Really? Oh, oh. You are a hard man to find. <laughs> oh. We need to we need to talk about the land. You have somewhere to sit and chew your cocoa while we talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> Si sí, nada más se es idea para decir con mi hijo, por su parte de mi hijo, porque así para que vive, ¿no es cierto? Su, para su casita, para que, para que viva abajo, no se podría, o qué será eso que vimos a ver. Entonces, esto viene abajo, ¿no es cierto? De ahí viene a trabajar acá arriba, a su chelismo. You know, I give all, you, you have all the money, and then and things just carry on the way they were when you owned it. Now is the time I want to protect it, so that it can get better. So. And I, but I'm not some rich gringo who's come here to throw people off land. That's why we need to talk. Si ahora se van a cortar, a sacar madera a mi hijo, entonces no hay con qué mantenerse mi hijo porque tiene su problema a mi hijo. Me dijiste que está en patria. No es sanito. Valvinita es. Todos esos tiempos de antes me dijiste, desde mi hermana, lo que ven me la dice, es que ya camina, hablan, todo no más bueno. Por eso, señorita, es no hay de dónde sacar plata, lo único no es más alto y ahí sí siempre hay para mantener de muchas bolas. ¿sí? No hay. Si no madre, no hay de dónde vivir. Well, I need to, I'm going to, I need to think about it. Gracias. Gracias, muy agradecido, señor. It's about, it's balancing the what I suppose ultimately what I value more do I value protecting Manu more than I value a family and that's what's complex for me because I probably value Manu more so I've, I've really got to um I'll put my sort of pity and sorrow for them aside and get on with the job that needs doing. That's my thought at the moment. 
and, and that means bigger than that. They need to leave the land. Next time, Charlie's wife comes to Peru and sees straight away that he's making a terrible mistake. And it wouldn't be easy. Our new conservation isn't just about putting a fence around something and leaving it. And Ch Charlie won't be told anything. Charlie is more determined than ever when he sees the devastation caused by gold mining. But it's not as easy as he hoped to get Ilias off the land. Then what so blasted would I be if I did? Go on an interactive journey with the Open University to explore the challenges facing the rainforest. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash rainforest and follow the links to the Open University. Coming up tonight, brand new drama investigating the seedy world of 50s Dublin. Gabriel Byrne is Quirk on BBC One now. Here on BBC Two, Captain Eric Winkle Brown. You might not